Hello and welcome to the 376th episode of the Crate and Crowbar, a podcast about PC gaming. I'm Alex Wiltshire and tonight I'm joined by Tom Francis. Hello. And Graham Smith. Hello. Hey, uh, first off, we should apologize for missing a couple of weeks. Um, it's been summer. We've been busy. <laughs> it's been warm and then cold. Um, don't know what it's been like for you. Oh, yeah. Tom living in Vancouver was incredibly warm for, yep. for a period. <laughs> yeah, Vancouver just caught fire and I had to run away. <laughs> I escaped to a nearby <laughs> island. <laughs> you went like to your days. island. <laughs> Yeah, that looked fairly horrific. If I felt bad last week feeling really kind of swelteringly hot when I knew that uh, the temperatures I was hearing from my relatives who also live in Vancouver were numbers that I couldn't actually imagine living in. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I think it was like 38, 39 downtown. Mm. There's some places outside of downtown that were like 40 um, Celsius, which is insane. And I, I really did escape to Vancouver Island, which is the only... A uh, relatively cool place I could find on a map. <laughs> I took a seaplane and just ran away for a few days. So I also feel bad. <laughs> I like the way that this started by us saying that we were busy, and then it turned. To... <laughs> and then it's like mm, busy doing what? Well, <laughs> Graham, I um I heard that you've spent some time uh, trying to buy uh, a new um. A new piece of hardware. I did. I bought, well, I bought a reservation for a Steam Deck, <laughs> which cost four pounds. I'm still actually undecided as to whether I want the thing, but we should explain what it is, first mm. of all. So Valve announced um, a new hardware product, which is a handheld PC gaming device. Um, it's called the Steam Deck. It runs the, a new version of the Steam operating system, which is built upon Linux, and a version of Steam, which is built specifically for the handheld. It's got, help me out here, it's going to leap in at any time. But as it's I got try some to memory. The specs. Yeah, it's, it's got, got a got, screen. Yeah. It's like a 7, 720, 720p screen. I think that's quite, yeah. I don't know, that, that's a number. And, and I do, it is important to me. I'm going to, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sort of do this sort of like, oh yeah, I don't really care about the specs. I do care. And it's <laughs> 720p, which makes it the, very, uh, the same resolution as a Switch. But a Switch, it is not because no. it's different. And <laughs> that's what the people say. That's what the pundits are saying. But Graham, why is it different? Because they're, well, they're both the computers and they're both on the hands. <laughs> you can plug them both into screens. Well, you can't you can't unhook the controllers. So it's it's building on stuff that Valve have done before. So for example, it's got the touchpads on the front of it, just like the face of a Valve Index controller or like the face of the old Steam controllers. So you know you've got two two thumbsticks, a bunch of face buttons, and a little pad on either side that you can use with your thumb. So you can theoretically play strategy games on it or first person shooters. So it's got a gyro inside it, and it's got um, you know the the thumbsticks are what's the word for it? Is it galvanic response? You know that you, the, you can oh, activate yeah. them just by touching them, and that's that sort of stuff. Um, but broadly, the thing that they're selling on selling it on is that hey, this is a PC. So what that means is that if you want to hook it up to your monitors, you can do that. If you want to stick Windows on there, you can do that. If you want to then download the Epic Game Store and stick that on there, then you can do so. And it will, they say, run every game that's on Steam currently. Um, it's able to do that because although it's a Linux-based operating system, Valve have been developing a thing called Proton over the last several years that allows any game essentially more or less any game. They say that, that it will be any game by the time it comes out, but there's a few exceptions technically right now because of some anti-cheat stuff around games like Apex Legends and stuff. Mm. But broadly, any game will run on it. And yeah, like they're saying, like I think it was like between two and eight hours of battery life, um, depending on what <laughs> kind of game. It's pretty broad range. But, you know, I understand yeah. why they have to provide yeah, a broad yeah. range based on... Because <laughs> I think they were saying it's based on like 
screen brightness, what kind of game you're playing, you know, whether it's something like Control, which is one of the games that they demoed on it when they showed it to IGN, will presumably run the battery down faster than something like Hades. I think you can also do things like lock games, or maybe games are will default to 30 frames per second. Mm. Um, and so, like, from my point of view, I'm like, hey, this is, like, I, I already own a Switch, my Switch is a thing I usually just play indie games on, occasionally like first party Nintendo stuff, but by and large, just indie games. And by and large, indie games that I already own on PC, hmm. um, that I've played on PC, and I think, oh, you know what? I'd really like to play this on my couch while lying down. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll pick it up on Switch. And so, like, the Steam Deck to me is like, cool. Maybe I wouldn't have to buy games a second time. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a nice It'll nice save you money feature. in the long run. <laughs> Well, yeah, maybe. But the thing is, on my Switch, I buy more games than I actually play. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe maybe it will save me money in the long run, but <laughs> maybe I wouldn't actually use it that much. And I, especially like when I look at, you know, like I say, they showed playing Control on it. Do I really want to play Control on a like a nine inch screen, seven twenty p at thirty frames per second on no. a thing that's going to run out of battery <laughs> after two hours. Uh, I think it was interesting to me that the, in the promo shots for it, they show control. I think I think that was their sort of poster child for like here's the thing you can't play on any portable system yet. Um, but then they also showed Hades, which was an interesting choice because that's already on Switch. And um, I think that that almost feels like an admission of like honestly the the things that most suit portable uh, handheld. Um, consoles are already there but uh yeah you won't have to buy them again and it will just be all of them because there isn't there isn't that much in the indie scene that doesn't come out on pc right it's so it's kind of the the all indie games platform yeah, yeah. that's true I, I just note that um you can play control on your switch but it's the um the cloud version oh really yeah and that's a, that's the switch is kind of a pro like approach yeah, so I'm excited can... about it because I want to play Monster Train, <laughs> yeah. um, which I, I don't think is on Switch yet, right? Slay the Spire is, but I don't think Monster Train is. Um, and just whatever the latest roguelike uh, deck builder is, <laughs> that's that's what I'm going to want to play when I'm watching a movie that I don't really care about. <laughs> See, that'll be the those are the interesting ones. Those are the like because they're about interface, and that's where all of the different investments and different kind of control methods that, that have built into it, you know, will you be able to use that as a touch screen? You know, how will it, how, you know, will you miss the mouse? Yeah. I mean, you, you will be able to, I'm sure, because I already can play monster train on a touch screen because my laptop has one. Um, ah. uh, but it's not very good. Uh, I much prefer playing with a gamepad because dragging cards, you know, in, in this and Slay the Spire, you have this hand of cards at the bottom of the screen. You often have like up to 10 cards and they, are he they overlap heavily. And it's so inaccurate when you try and grab one and it grabs the wrong one. If you let go without putting it exactly back where it was, you've played that card now. So the stakes of, <laughs> of making a mistake are huge. And so it's just much better to play with a controller. You just want like a really cleanly defined input of just left, right, yes, no. Yeah, select, hit it, yeah. It was at the point I got really excited when it was uh, announced, and um, and then I found myself wanting to plug it into my screen, like oh, that, you know, I could just plug it in yeah. at my desk, and I could run <laughs> it there as well. And I thought, what what am I talking about? <laughs> That's the same screen that I've got my PC plugged into. What? Why? Why? Because I I don't actually um, play on my Switch very much in handheld, um, and then I saw that the I think the the um, uh, it is like, I think it's 600 and something grams and the switch is for 400 grams or something like that. It's, it's not, it's not double the, 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 the weight, but it's like a third again, as much as what the weight or something. I think it's like double the size there, right? Isn't it? Like and yeah, it's quite, it's quite big. Yeah. And I thought, is that something I really want to use? Well, am I going to, you know, am I, am I going to want to play on it handheld? Because that being its point. I think you actually get this is this is bizarre, but I think you actually can just plug a controller into it too, so it can just be this weird like middleman between your TV and the controller. <laughs> like yeah, it has a screen and the controls, but you're not yeah. using either of them. Because <laughs> yeah, we I, I I really really want our um I would love our our house network to be good enough to um to uh to to run the kind of the Steam remotes. What is that? What is it called Steam remote? 
you know the kind of like the in-house streaming yeah steam link? yeah steam link is it is so because it because it's now on ios so we've got an apple tv and therefore like it, it is an app on there and it and it works really great except for when for no reason our home network just sort of just stops for a half a second and then suddenly the, the game was beautiful and then just is unplayable and ah. you never know that when it's going to happen so i do i would love to play pc games in in our living room but yeah yeah um so i have a switch uh but i don't use it very much a i don't like it in portable mode because the screen is just too small and i would like it to just sit in my lounge and play things on my on my screen but i actually don't like the switch aspect of it where i've got to like slot it into a dock and unclip the controllers and then like i've got to get up and, and go over to the tv to do that uh and I can't just plug it straight into the TV. Like, even though I have a connector that would go into a USB-C port, that doesn't work with a normal Switch. I believe it does with a Switch Lite because that's the only way you can play on a TV. But with a regular Switch, I can't just plug it into my TV, whereas a Steam Deck, I can. Yeah, that would work. How was your experience of actually buying it? Uh, I mean, I, well, not that bad, like, uh, considering it's a, like a brand new product and there's quite a lot of buzz around it, but it did encounter some bugs. So, like, I think it dropped at like 6 p.m or something like that and i started trying to buy it around 10 past six and it was the website was down by which i mean steam <laughs> like the steam <laughs> store was down it wouldn't load and i eventually got the page to load but some of the elements broken uh, and i kept refreshing and then when i eventually got like the link I needed to click when I pressed it, it popped up an error message to my to say my Steam account wasn't old enough. Um, and my Steam account is 18 years old. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I was in the friends and family Steam beta, so it's about as old <laughs> as a user account for Steam as they can be. Um, but this was like the, the, the stuff that Valve introduced to try and stop scalpers from getting the Steam Deck that your, your account had to have existed for like two weeks or something. So basically you had to have had a Steam account prior to the Steam Deck having been announced. So you can just, you know, sign up for 100 accounts and buy 100 of them. Um, but about about 15 minutes after I had that problem, I eventually got in and got it reserved, which I think cost four pounds. The thing I didn't note... Um, was that at a certain point, pretty quickly, like within half an hour, they started saying that they had kind of already sold out of the first allotment of of Steam Decks, and so instead of shipping like December twenty twenty one, everything past that point was going to ship like October twenty twenty two or something like that. Um, so I'm not actually sure which tranche of steam decks i'm in whether i'm in the october 22 <laughs> ones or whether it will be december 21 um but like i say i'm also like kind of ambivalent as to whether do i really want to spend hundreds of pounds on this thing so i can play games five and a half feet to my left <laughs> where i'm sitting right now in front of my computer because yeah i just i don't travel enough anymore like if i had a commute or i went on planes <laughs> maybe one day i will again but I don't anymore. So my switch is purely, I think I play while lying down on the couch and even then not very often. So given Steam remote and the ability to just streaming games from my computer to like this, isn't there a cheaper solution to this? Or shouldn't I just sit in a chair instead? I don't know. I'm undecided. Because like, Tom, didn't you buy it as well? Yeah. So Any do questions? You, are, <laughs> <laughs> are you definitely going to actually go through with the purchase or are you yeah. going to back out? No, I want it. Um, because, uh, yeah, A, I just want to be able to play indie games really easily, uh, either in front of my TV while I'm watching something else or, or to easily plug it in. Like I played Ori in the Blind Forest on my TV, having bought it on Steam, by sort of like, I had to sit on my bed with my laptop plugged into both the power and my controller and the TV in this. There's only one spot in the room where I can connect to all three without the <laughs> plugs falling out and it gets massively <laughs> hot. And uh, it was kind of awkward as hell. And yeah, I like the idea of just having a, a single thing that I could just, I could just plug it into my big screen if I want to play it on the big screen or if it's something low engagement like uh, Monster Train, I can just play it uh, while I'm watching. I have, let me tell you, I, I recently finished 
all of the movies on my Netflix list by playing Monster Train while watching them. <laughs> Which is, that's been like a, a decades long quest. I remember a time when I was like, I was horribly ill over Christmas for like four days and I still didn't watch a single thing on my Netflix list. <laughs> like adding something to your Netflix list kills all of your interest in it, right? They just sit there and they just stay in the face every time you log on to Netflix and all desire to watch them is completely gone. But then if I could be doing something else while it's playing, then then I don't need to be that excited about it. And oftentimes there's there's nice surprises in there. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, so, Tom, there are a whole new tranche of, uh, of of movies that have been released subsequent yeah, to you I have finishing to admit, your list. I have to admit, I uh, I was duped a bit into a full sense of, of victory here because if this was true, I looked on my Netflix list and there were no movies left. There were a bunch of series and stuff, but um, uh, I really thought I'd finish them all. And then, but I did think that was, that was abrupt. Like I, there was a quite a lot there a few weeks ago. I don't remember watching all of them. And I, so I suspected some of them had been removed from Canadian Netflix or something. So like Netflix helped me out by just deleting some things. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then a bunch of them fucking came back. Now there's like three movies on there that I haven't seen that have been on there for years and they just weren't there temporarily. So actually my accomplishment is slightly undermined, but I will get through them by playing Monster Train. <laughs> Um, anyway, the, the other thing I want it for is I want to play Tactical Breaches on it because that will tell me whether it's worth making a Switch version. Because yeah. I can see, does point. it work on that size screen? Does it feel right with, I mean, we're going to do gamepad controls anyway, but it'll just be a, you know, is the interface clear enough, basically? That's really interesting. It's like, it's like a, you get to release one edition of the game, the PC version on Steam, and you get to, to test out the, the possible Switch edition almost for yeah. free. Plus, if it really catches on and takes over the world, we don't have to make a Switch version. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious how much money Valve are losing on these because, like, it is cheap. How much is it in pounds? I think it varies, but isn't it somewhere between, like, the cheapest is 400 or 399 or something, isn't it? And 300 then, and something, yeah. yeah I and like then it's... the most expensive is 750 or something. Yeah, and the cheap one is they're all the same performance. It's just the memory. I mean, the same processor and graphics card and stuff, That's which right, is yeah. kind of wild. Like three three ninety nine dollars, I think it is in the US for the, the lowest version for a yeah. a game. Sorry, for a PC that can play modern games at seven twenty p smoothly and is is the size of I don't know a small thing, two switches. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that 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 can't possibly be costing them that little. They must be losing money on it, and that. We've come to expect that from like Sony and Microsoft, where they are selling something that they wholly own as a walled garden. They're going to make money off every single purchase you ever make on it. And okay, realistically, most people with this are going to buy things mostly on Steam, so Valve will make money from it. But it's unusual. I mean, I think unprecedented for um, if they are taking a loss for a company to to you know do a loss leader like this, but not lock it down. Just let yeah, sure. As you say, Graham, you can install Windows and Epic Game Store, and I bet Epic will will make a version of the Epic Store that runs on yeah. SteamOS. Yeah, so the, so the 64 gigabyte version is £349. The 256 gigabyte version is £459. And the 512 gigabyte version is £569. So it doesn't even go up, up as high as £700 for the most yeah, expensive. Yeah, it's less than I thought. I remember thinking, looking at the dollar values. The the prices, the, keeping them all the same. I mean, it, it, it totally makes sense that they're all the same technical specs other than the 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 it's just the storage is different because that that's like i think that's what people i think that's what people expect now because you don't have to message you don't have to deal with you know the differences you don't have to deal with games running terribly on one and 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 okay yeah. on another and like and I bet, it's the way uh, that iphones work today like where you buy you buy any iphone it's got a you know the most expensive one has the same chip in it as the, as the, oh, really? as the cheapest one yeah, it's quite that's interesting. Right. The um, the new Apple Silicon laptops, the the Air has the same uh, chip in it as the as the most expensive version. I can't remember what it was now. Um, it's the same, exactly the same chip, except for it's got one fewer um, uh, GPU cores. I think it's got seven cores rather than eight, and that's because <laughs> that's they put they put the the, the chips that failed like so. Oh you know, no way. Yeah, you put so the one the one where one of the you know one of the cores is is not <laughs> behaving right, so they just switched it off and put it in the cheap wow. version. Wow, so it's, that's amazing. it's all the same dies and everything. It's just efficiency, <laughs> efficiency. <laughs> that makes perfect sense, but it also sounds completely wild. Like, oh, a bunch yeah. of these broke, so we're just shipping them yeah, in the cheaper model. <laughs> stick them in the cheap one. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, because I was—I don't know if this is still true, but back when I was more into PC hardware um, and you know looking to build my own PC on the cheap and stuff, there were all these like secret exploits, basically, where you buy this chip because uh, it sounds like it's the cheap version that's not as good as the p more powerful one, but it is actually literally the same hardware, and they've just like soft locked it to run <laughs> at a lower clock speed because it's cheaper for them to make them all the same, make like you know however many of the, the the better chips and then just soft lock some of them um oh, that's not the right term but in software yeah. restrict them from running that fast because making a bunch of the same things that are all the same is cheaper than making having two different production lines <laughs> and that's that you could just like you know overclock them safely because this hardware is actually built to run that. <laughs> it's so such a strange economy isn't it <laughs> yeah there's a part of me that thinks like I'm slightly tempted to just get rid of my desktop PC and <laughs> just replace it with a Steam Deck. Yeah. Like yeah. if if it could plug it into PC monitors and it ran most things, like I don't play super high power games that yeah. often, and I've got laptops that I do most of my work on anyway. <laughs> and so, but by and, by that by that same argument. Why don't you just get, I mean, why, what doesn't one just get a laptop? I think I feel the answer to this, why you would want this handheld, you know, for all in one computing solution, but like laptops don't, why don't they do it already? Cause you could, you could do all of the monster train in front of the TV with that. Mm. No, that's a good point. I don't have an immediate answer to that. Uh, I think it's that I don't currently own a laptop that's good enough to run games, <laughs> <laughs> and the Steam Deck is shiny and new, <laughs> and so it is admittedly <laughs> cheaper as well. I think, but I, I think actually, I think one of the answers for me is, um, and I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently, and it's about the fact that it it, feel, it I think that it will feel dedicated in a way. You know, obviously you can do what, with it what you like, actually. But I'm I'm sure that when you switch it on, it will very quickly boot up, and you'll be, in, you know, very quickly into the this slick um, new Steam interface, and it will feel like this is your dedicated game machine, and it's not going to put up uh, some sort of login thing that mm. sort of keeps kind of trying to log into to to, to Microsoft and mm. remind you that a browser needs updating and and so on, like pulling you into worlds of work and and kind of just sort of social media and things. And I think that that focus, I'm valuing it more and more and more. You know, I've been sort of fiddling around with kind of, you know, sort of I talked about a long time ago, this Mr. Um, emulation project and platform. And it's been really good to have this machine, this emulation thing. You could have, a, you could totally have, a, you know, you can emulate on your PC incredibly well. You can, you know, you but emulation there is sharing the desktop with all these other things. Whereas this one machine, you have to wire it in, you have to invest in it. You have to kind of get it set up and running. And, but once it's there, it, it says you should only ever play games on this. And that is, I don't know, there, there is a real pull to that. And I think that that's for me would be the value of, of something like the steam deck. I yeah, do just not having Twitter on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pay a lot of money just to not have Twitter. <laughs> uh, I do. I do think software is going to be a big thing with this because Valve have obviously they've they've done hardware stuff before and they've done, for example, the Steam controller. And so Steam already has an interface in there and config tools where people can like create their own controller configs for games designed specifically for the steam controller and then you can access that through a steam interface and you know it's like the steam workshop but just for controller configs um and you can go in there and download a different config and give it a go and rate it and all this sort of stuff and so like it, they've built an ecosystem that's designed for that um but that's really counter to what you were just saying about oh you know you just turn it on and it, it quick resumes <laughs> and you're in and you're playing the game no it's you're in and you're playing the game and it, the game wasn't built for the Steam Deck. And <laughs> the controls don't quite work just yeah. how you want them on the controller. And then so now you're going into Steam's interface and uh, is this fucking bun boy 
59 has got, you know, he's made this thing and it's got three, two and a half thousand downloads and it's got 4.6 rating. All right. I'll try that one. All right. Now it's shit. It's like the A and B's the round the wrong way. Okay. I'll go back to the thing, download the second config, give that a go. Uh, yeah, it's stuttering a little bit. I'll just go into the config settings and see how we fiddle around with the graphics. So, and then you get to a cut scene and I'm like, I can't read the writing. The font is too small. It wasn't designed for a screen this size. <laughs> Hang on. Go back into the settings. You're fiddling around with that. And I can foresee this situation because I've owned a Valve Index and I've owned a Steam controller and I owned the, the Steam Link when it was like a hardware thing. Um, every single one of them has just been this giant pain in the ass. <laughs> <Of> like, <laughs> you're just shimmying back and forward between like two different screens on two different computers, trying to get things to talk to each other and get the conflict yeah. set up the right Sounds way. Sounds to me like they've, they'll have captured the very essence of PC gaming, <laughs> the chase, <laughs> the real game, which is... Uh, it really is a PC. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I, yeah. slogan. <laughs> Steam input has uh, has been a real pain in the ass for me. Actually, it's um, it feels like a thing, you know, it's designed to be a sort of an interface that helps you get things working together. And for me, it's mostly been an obstacle to preventing things that otherwise would have worked together by jumping in and trying to take over. Like I tried plugging my PS5 controller into my laptop the other day uh, to play Monster Train. Surprise, surprise, and it was working fine the first time, and then I had to quit the game for a different reason. Like I needed to reboot it, and then the next time I started up, it was working fine for a second. And then a little notification popped up from Steam saying, oh, Steam Input, Steam input has found your PlayStation 5 controller. And then it just stopped working completely. Like the, <laughs> the A and B buttons would still work. I could still confirm or back out of menus, but none of the thumbsticks nor the D-pad would move my menu selection. So I could only choose the thing that was just the first option. Like, Can you just fucking sit down, please, Steam? We didn't need you. I didn't ask you to show up here. And I looked at all the options. Nothing is enabled. Like there's no, there's an option to like enable Steam input for each individual controller type and PlayStation is already unchecked. So according to Steam, Steam's own config, it's not doing anything except that it does pop up a notification saying it, saying that it's found it and it's, um, uh, you know, taking control of it. And that just breaks it for me. Thanks. I'm glad that you're both seeing like a long road of being angry at this machine <laughs> that you've paid four pounds to, uh, to have a right to buy at some point in the <laughs> unknown future. Even even stuff that's been like log running in Steam, like Steam Cloud, for example, backs up save, you know, because they say you'll be able to play a game on Steam Deck, put it down, and then immediately pick up from where you left off on your computer because Steam Cloud's going to sync the saves. But every time I go to boot up a game which has got Steam Cloud on it, it will say, oh, the, the version on Steam Cloud <laughs> is newer than the one on your computer. And it will give you the timestamp and it will be a one second difference. And it's like, oh God. no, this is the same save. It just, you saved it on my computer and then in the next second <laughs> uploaded it. <laughs> it's the same file. <laughs> I just took one second to upload. Well, like, what? <laughs> Uh, and every time, so every time I put up a game, I have to make a decision about like, do I want to discard the one in the cloud or do I want to overwrite the one on my local computer? And it's just little niggles like that, that I can see <laughs> <laughs> being a problem. And along with just the anxiety of like, oh, maybe if I tweak the settings, it would run a little bit better or look a little bit better. And, and then just beyond that, yeah, none of the games are going to have been built for this kind of screen or form factor in mind. So yeah. even st like, Valve saying, hey, every game in the Steam library, but is it just going to be the ones that are already on Switch <laughs> that are going to actually feel nice to play on a screen that size, um, that, you know, be able to accommodate the UI? Do you want to play Disco Elysium on this? You know, because it's not, it's not control. It's not going to be super intensive uh, and, and run at a low frame rate in a way that's going to be a problem. But are you going to want to read lots of writing on it? Oh, I'm glad I didn't buy it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling good. <laughs> the, 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 the fix is, yeah, I mean, obviously they've got to get developers on board and maybe that's just they're thinking it needs to have a large enough install base and then developers will have the incentive they need. But as well as funding it and making it a loss leader, first parties tend to also then partner with a bunch of developers and go to them and pay them and say, look, we're going to give you money in order to make a Steam Deck refined version of your thing, you know, release a patch. 
I thought, um, I think one of the other things, that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fundamentally waiting for units to be in, in reviewers and, and people's hands to see what they say, because I thought that the way they introduced it through IGN was a single source was, was actually not very Valve. Um, Valve do tend to show off things for the first time in a kind of quite no holds barred kind of way. You know, they say, you know, you get to play through the whole game, um, right? You know, they they invite sev- you know several different places to to do so to just have one uh, one you know and watching IGN's coverage, um, you know, it was it was very uncritical. There was you know, and obviously they yeah. they couldn't really be you know I, I would have been there not being able to be critical because i won't have experienced it fully either you know and it's kind of in development hardware but it did make me think sort of this is very sight unseen hardware here yeah i mean i i i, I am pretty confident that there will be other write-ups of it soon <laughs> from other outlets. <laughs> <laughs> Pretending like I don't know, but yeah, both <laughs> love are inviting people over and trying to work out how to do that. The, the part of the obstacle to it is um, travel to the US is such yeah, a nightmare at the moment. And yeah. so if, even if you can fly there, uh, you, you know, wherever you're from, wherever you're based. Um, when you get back, you might have to think quarantine for two weeks. So there are unique obstacles, as you're aware. As a man who tried to go to Valve last <laughs> <this> year, <laughs> yeah, just oh, yeah. as the gates closed. <laughs> what's it? What's nuts is that like, I went to Valve in September 2019, I think maybe October um, and they flew a bunch of journalists out there from like all over America and a couple from Europe and uh, we didn't know what we were going there to see and it was the Steam library update I <laughs> 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 uh, just had like a lot of journalists who had travelled for like 10 hours on a plane oh <laughs> and God. then it was like oh <laughs> Oh, okay. I thought maybe it was like going to be like a new VR hardware or like some like new game, something big, something big. No, oh, okay. Library update, some new UI. No, a tw- twenty-five pre- minute presentation, uh, and that was it. Gabe Newell, no, he's in no. New Zealand. No. <laughs> And, and no developer interviews anyway. No interviews. <laughs> Just like a and a at the Q&A at the end where you've got one, what, a chance to ask one question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't mind. I, I ate in like the IHOP opposite my hotel five times and then got back on a plane. <laughs> it's a nice three days in Seattle. <laughs> wow. Just talk about some games. Um, yeah. Should Tom, what have you been playing? I have been playing Rogue Book, which is it's a roguelike deck builder. <laughs> <laughs> but that is my comfort zone, and I'm not leaving it. <laughs> um, it's the roguelike deck builder from him who did Magic, Richard Garfield. Um, oh, that one, yeah, okay. And it, for me, it kind of came out of nowhere. I hadn't heard of it until it was out. Um, and its twist is, so it's very, very Slay the Spire. It's, it's, um, kind of a nice full circle really, because I know Slay the Spire is partly inspired by magic. Um, and now magic guy has made a game inspired by Slay the Spire. Um, it's very similar in lots of ways. The main difference is that you have two characters and they, uh, one of them is in front and one of them is in back and many different cards will switch their positions. And whenever damage is incoming, it hits whoever's in the front. Whenever you play a block card, who all of your cards belong to one of your two characters. And if it, whichever character it belongs to, it moves that character to the front and then gains the block. And the block is kind of shared, or it's it's you know for your for your team. Um, so you're never wasting block. Like it's impossible to play a block card and, and have the block be on the wrong character or or in the back where it doesn't count. Um, so. It's mostly like the switching is um, kind of 
uh, you know, errs on the side of player friendliness. It tries to make it so that it works well. And there's a little bit of extra strategy there because they have independent health bars. So it's a question of, you know, most of the time you want your guy with most hit points at the front. But once he's really injured, maybe you want your other character to go to the front to take the next hit, uh, especially because the only sources of healing in the game are potions that heal both of you. So it pays to distribute the damage between your two characters to maximize the efficiency of healing. Um, mm. It's got this uh, very distinct art style, which I actually really like. Some people don't like it at all. It's it's extremely lush, I would say. And it's also very kind of cute and pleasant. Uh, kind of the opposite of Slay the Spire, where <laughs> it is um, the sort of you know technical uh, uh, skill uh, of the artist is very high. I don't know what the hell I'm trying to say. Um, it's, it's incredibly <laughs> yeah, detailed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think the people who don't like it probably have issues with the the style rather than the execution, I hope. Um, and it has that kind of, it's very painterly. Uh, there's lots of areas of not entirely flat color, but like gentle gradients and very harmonious things. All the grass mm. kind of blends into each other. But then the characters have extremely crisp details. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of, I just find it very pleasant. It's just very um, kind of cute and nice. And a lot of the enemies are kind of cute, which is funny. Um, I'm looking at a screenshot here where I'm fighting a yakapult, which is a catapult that fires yaks operated by little furry gremlins. And <laughs> it has a little pop-up thing. You know, it does things like the spy does where, you know, it tells you a description of what the thing does. And then every keyword it mentions as a separate tooltip for what that keyword means. Um, and so one of them is elite war yaks. At the end of each turn, give all yaks eight block and plus four power. Brackets, yakapult is a yak. <laughs> <laughs> in case that I guess that wasn't obvious from the from the fact that it's made of wood and not a yak <laughs> we'll just tell you yakapult it is a yak don't don't concern yourself with it it's a yak it's going to every turn throw out a new yak which will also be a yak but is it is itself a yak <laughs> i like that also that that sort of plays into kind of garfield-esque sort of magic uh lo- the requirement for logic you know sort of when you call a category something and then things that affect that category therefore that affect all things of that category yeah i like that precision it, there's lots of sort of weird humor to find in that yeah i, I actually also really appreciate you know that is an ambiguous thing so thank you for just saying it like rather than <laughs> hoping that we can deduce it the one of the biggest differences with say the spire actually other than the two characters thing is the overworld is a very strange system um where it is it has a kind of fog of war but you can't reveal Fog of War by just walking into it. It actually, Fog of War blocks you. And the only way to reveal it is to use a paintbrush, which will hmm. reveal a certain number of tiles around you. And that's a very limited resource. You only have like three of them or something when you start the game. Um, but for every fight that you take part in, um, you will get given uh, some kind of ink. And an ink usually just reveals like five spaces in a straight line. And so because your standard paintbrushes do this kind of area of effect thing, it's it's all about finding the most efficient way to use them. So you don't want to use one right off the bat because um, you are you have a, this revealed area that's all kind of contiguous and just a big blob of, of space you can walk around. You can walk right to the edge of that and use a paintbrush and you'll reveal a bunch of tiles, but you'll only get half of the value really because a lot of the area of effect around you is stuff that's already revealed. So what you want to do is do at least one fight to get an ink, which then lets you reveal a straight line into the unknown then you walk to the end of that like peninsula of known space right. and then deploy your paintbrush there to get the maximum effect, which is such a sort of technical, <laughs> abstract, weird thing. Uh, and it takes a while to sort of, it took me a while to figure that out. I was using them inefficiently at first because uh, I didn't know I'd get an ink for fighting somebody. <laughs> that wasn't intuitive to me for some reason. Um, <laughs> and then like you don't get cards for, for battles. You have to then, the only way you get cards is by exploring more territory. And then within this territory you explore, there'll just be like piles of gold lying on the ground cards uh i don't know what you call them but like uh chests i guess that can contain a choice of cards um and other bonuses that are almost all positive or new new enemy encounters is that's the thing is is like if you spend a lot of uh inks and brushes revealing territory but you don't find any new enemy encounters you're going to run out of inks and then you've got to use your brushes in an inefficient way and the path to the end boss is revealed right from the start so you can never be cut off from that you can't you know be out of ink and unable to finish the chapter but you don't want to go straight there obviously because all the encounters along the way will let you level up and increase your your deck and then the other thing philosophically that's very different to slay the spire and especially different to monster train is that 
it is sort of uh, just uh, completely against letting you remove cards. You can add cards all the time. I in my first run, I never got I complete well, I, I got all the way to the final boss of the game on my first run, and I was never once offered an opportunity to ever remove a card from my deck. I I was adding and adding and adding. I think I had like 35 cards in my deck or something and never had a chance to take one out ever. So all your basic crappy cards that you start with, those are still in your deck right to the end of the game. What it does have um, that I'm only just at the start of is a big web of of permanent um, unlocks where uh, you spend this meta currency that you earned through your runs to to change what will spawn in the landscape. So, for example, having more piles of gold or more health potions that you can find. Or one of the first things you can unlock is an alchemist, I think it's called, which is a service that will you give it a card and it gives you a different one back. So that is a way of, you can't reduce the size of your deck with that, but you can flush some of these junk cards and, and get some better stuff. But that, like I say, is not available the first time you play. Um, and it's still very much a game about having a big deck all the times. I'm, mm. I'm really curious. I have to look if there's an interviews about this because I want to know what, what the thinking behind that is. Obviously, the extreme version of a small deck is undesirable because it lets the player gives the player too much control and you can end up with a you know too efficient a build where you just do the same thing in every fight because your system just works it's just this card lets me play this card lets me play that card and you get some infinite combo or something so i understand why they don't want to give you that much control but to achieve that you don't need to constantly expand the player's deck forever (laughs) and uh never let them reduce it back down so i'm curious why why the philosophy is that bigger decks are just better. Like they specifically reward you every five cards or something you add to your deck, you get to permanently improve one of your characters or your whole party in with perks that are sort of like relics. They, they sort of have big sweeping upgrades to, to your whole thing. So they really want you to have a huge deck and it's, I don't know that it entirely pays off. I think it's a good idea. So to do, stop you, you. do you feel in control? Um, Less so than certainly less so than Monster Train. Monster Train is the game where by the you gave you so much control. You can remove so many cards. You can duplicate your best cards. You, it's just like if you if you have an idea and it clicks with what you're offered, you can build the most efficient, like brutal, um, mm. uh, superb deck. And that's the fun of Monster Train. Is by the end of a run, you've just got something that's so fucking powerful. Um, and you certainly don't have that here. Uh, it's I I guess I like that. I don't know. It's, it's more more varied turn to turn. Each each turn is more different to the last than it is in, you know, by the end of Monster Train. But it also does, you know, the obvious problem with this is even right towards the end of the game, you can get dealt a hand of all defends and strikes, which are the junk cards. And when you're facing the final boss, that ain't gonna cut it. <laughs> now you're dead. So <laughs> it does it does feel t- like more random. And some of your deaths are just kind of out of the blue. Just well, I just didn't get dealt any block because I couldn't control the size of my deck well enough to ensure that I, uh, you know, would always get some block. So that part doesn't really work. I also think, um, uh, the first boss I got, the first end boss I got, um, was very much just a you picked the wrong build, you lose. Because I had gone with a Shiv build. It has an equivalent to Slay the Spire Shivs, which are zero-cost cards that do a little bit of damage. And the whole idea is you... It's actually the thing they let you do in this game, the character who has that, I can't remember her name, um, she is allowed to do the thing you can that Slay the Spire doesn't let you do in general, which is combine Shivs with Strength, or in this game it's called Power, which is Strength and Power are... Uh, a persistent stat that increases the damage of all your attacks and of course shivs are zero cost and you can stack them you can accumulate loads of them and they do a little bit of damage but if you have a lot of strength or power then they do a lot of damage and that you know massively um scales and that is what this character is all about like she gets loads of shivs and she gets loads of things that boost her power and so you can get this super efficient um uh killing machine where she just gets so many bonuses every shiv is doing so much damage and you get loads of them the boss i got increases the cost of all your cards by one so that just kills that bill that's a, everything i've worked towards over the hard last like hour and 45 minutes i think it was it's just nope you picked the wrong build you've lost the game <laughs> there was you no know way about to that boss in the way that um, monster monster train allows you to prepare for that boss because um, you know what they're paying does 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 this game tell you that's a good question i can't swear that you don't but i don't think i had any uh, useful information like it's possible that maybe if you mouse over the boss it might tell you the name of it or something 
but it yeah, certainly but you, you didn't know what it yeah what, 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 i certainly what didn't see any pop-up that said what their special ability would be which was the information that i needed and even if it had i think that would still feel like um a bit of a fuck you plus that would only be in the last chapter of the thing like you you that boss is not on the map from the start of the game. It's like Slayer Spire, where each chapter has its own boss, and you can only see it that far ahead. You can only see to the boss of this current chapter. So I'd already spent like three chapters building up to this deck, um, and it would have been too late to pivot, I think. It's such a hard counter. And like, yeah, Slayer Spire has, you know, the Time Eater, who is an en enemy that gets stronger every X cards you play. And so that is bad for Shiv decks because you're playing yeah. a lot of cheap cards. But it's not fatal to shift decks. I've beaten the timing to the shift decks plenty of times. And uh, it's that it's that nice balance for me where it's like, okay, this is the hardest boss I could face with this deck, but my deck is real fucking good and I'm still going to kill it. <laughs> like, whereas this is just a hard no. It's just, nope, you cannot. That Like, I have broken the fundamental feature of your deck, which is free cards. Yeah. So yeah, the, the thing most people have complained about who, who don't like this game, is it actually hasn't been that popular amongst, like, you know, for example, the Roguelikes channel in our own community and just, you know, friends of mine who are into these kinds of games because of the persistent unlocks, they are too strong, most people feel. So you start out too weak, or actually that's not the complaint. The complaint is that once you unlock a few things, you are you get much stronger and it just snowballs from there. You know, you just the game, once you've won once, the game just gets easier and easier. and it feels like a kind of grind just to get all of the um, all of the unlocks that are just a straight boost. You know, th things like you can just find more artifacts on the map, you know, relics or whatever you call them. Um, you just get more good stuff over the course of the campaign. So, of course, that makes you massively stronger. Yeah. So what, when you're, when you're um, on the campaign map, on the, in the overworld, what, um, what are you kind of looking for and thinking about during that phase? Because that's something that... Uh, isn't in the big favourites having an overworld. Most of those games are just find a linear or you're choosing sort of yeah. you know, left, right, poor paths. Yeah, it is It is quite different. Because um, Slay the Spire, you've got like choice of paths, but you're trying to... Slay the Spire wants you to kind of really think ahead and plan out what your later route is going to be so that you make this, the short-term decisions with the long-term decisions in mind, knowing all of the options that are going to come up ahead. This one, as you explore more, or you are getting more and more options, I'm usually holding off from doing like, you know, I'll find a, a fight I could do. I don't want to do it just yet. I want to go and see what my other options are. If there's some money or some cards or a relic I can get before I take that fight, I'd rather do that first because the health you lose is persistent, obviously. And the better I am before the fight, the less health I'll lose. Um, so it's just a strategic thing of in what, as I get more and more options, in what order do I want to do them? And do, is it worth me spending more ink and paint to get more options before I commit to a battle? And usually it's just a case of if I still have ink left, then yes, I should I should throw out some some lines of visibility and then go cast some more paintbrushes and get more and more stuff before I take on a fight. Uh, and then when I'm out of ink, I've got to do a fight to get another ink. Um, and there's probably an argument that you should save one ink because some of the inks just suck. <laughs> like there's some that just like you've got to use up a paintbrush to, to use this. Like you've got to, um, uh, it doesn't do anything on its own. Um, and so if you, that's your only option, then you can become quite inefficient. Um, I sort of like how spatial it all is. Like there have been times where I'm like, I can actually, if I stand just here and I use this five tile ink, I can throw out a line of visibility that is going to connect to this little pool of area of land that I already know about, that I can already walk around if I can get to it, and sort of connect me up to that island. And in that island is a watchtower. And if I touch the watchtower, that's going to reveal all the, all the area around it. So it's actually better not to use a paintbrush here because that area is going to get revealed later. So I like that there's that level of strategy to it. But mm. it is, uh, it's very weird. And you can definitely just, just fuck up your run just by not understanding how to exploit that and what order to do things in. Yeah, and does it does it dovetail well with the kind of just the collecting and and playing cards bits? Because um, for the moment, because like listening to you described it, I don't really see the relationship between playing cards and 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 getting sight lines and finding ink and stuff. It seems they seem totally different systems. Yeah, they pretty much are. Um it's yeah you're, you're getting cards from like vaults and stuff but it all just feels like a like a meta layer it doesn't sort of 
hang together in any particular cohesive way. Yeah. It's funny. It does look, it does look really pretty though. The art's so yeah. really kind of nice. I'm looking at like a little kind of um, ogre frog guy. who has got a massive yep. great golden fist. Yeah. He's it's one of nice. your starting characters. <laughs> He has a lot of headbang cards, and I, I haven't really do- tried a headbang build yet, but that is something to do with, uh, I think maybe it buffs him or something. Um, but yeah, that's a build I haven't explored yet. The white it, have you found anything that kind of sort of uh, build archetypes that you haven't really come across before in the, in other deck builders? Um, good question. The... There's a kind of uh, hunter type guy who has a lot of healing stuff. Like he can sort of leech health. Actually, yeah, his his whole system is pretty good. It, it's got rage, um, where every time he takes damage, he builds up rage. And once his rage is full, most of his cards uh, have a sort of super version that will play if you play them when your rage is full. And that will drain all your rage when you do it. Uh, so the strategy is like, which of these, when is it a good time to spend all your rage? and you want this character to take damage, so he builds rage. He also has a lot bunch of healing things. Um, so it's a case of like getting him to take the damage, then managing to heal the damage. And sometimes it, it all comes together perfectly because one of his cards, one of his starting cards, will heal him if it kills the enemy. And mm. it only does eight damage or something. But if you're fully raged up, then it will do 16 damage and heal you for more. And of course, that's more likely to kill the enemy or there's more situations where it will kill the enemy. Um, so it's perfect if you can, you know, intentionally let him take enough damage that it will boost him up to the 25 rage that then enables him to play that uh, card for more damage and kill like a 15 health enemy uh, so that, you know, without the rage, you wouldn't have been able to kill them. And with the rage, you both kill them and you get not just health, but more health. And it all kind of like a gambit pays out. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds all right. <laughs> sound I'd, unconvinced well no it does sound like I, i'm just i was started just thinking about like ah oh, ah oh, the little the the um the the candle people and and the idea oh, yeah. of the builds that are all about just killing them and you know and yeah. like just counterintuitive weirdnesses like that that that's just shot through um and monster you know monster train and things like that and you know i was just sort of thinking about the space in which you can design this stuff and Ah, oh, Garfield. Could he be the one that finds new stuff in this space? Because, because you know, we've got the we've got the candle people who look awesome <laughs> and also are all about you, like dealing with their short lives and killing them and and all that stuff, and then bringing them back. You know, that's a sort of yeah. I, 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 I like it's that. not it's, it's like... not like it's a genre that is is kind of that 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 is starving for new ideas but um it's just that when those ideas come along they're just so exciting yeah i like that history of the roguelike deck builder that 2017 slay the spire is released and then 2020 the wax people who die (laughs) that's the only only progress that's been made in this genre in the last four years This uh, this one is it's not just from Richard Garfield, is it? It's also like the development team he's worked with on it. I think were the developers of Feria, Abracam Entertainment. Yes, <laughs> I don't know um, what Feria is. Fe- so, uh, as Roguebook is to Slay the Spire, Feria was to Hearthstone. Ah, it was so it was a, a collectible card game deck builder and its twist was that i think you were placing units on a hex grid yeah looks kind of like, like that other game that did the same thing but had cool <laughs> pixel arty one yeah i know the one that you mean but i'm not gonna remember its name i'm not gonna remember its name either and like the pixel arty one got all the kind of like critical attention but they both had a similar path where they started as free to play games and then like Feria started free to play and then abandoned that and went to a premium model where you could just buy it and get all the cards um but it was a kind of like modest success basically rather than a rather than a big smash um but you know I played it a little bit back in the day and it was nice it was you know it was the nice version of one of those games and it looked pretty and that sort of stuff yeah the art looks really nice so that's obviously their their trademark style rogue book does it take place like on the pages of a book? 
maybe yeah i think i think that's what the fog of war metaphor is that it's like unwritten pages because it does have a kind of painterly style and i okay. think the the unexplored place is it looks like parchment that's what i thought because there was there was that other game that did that right like ring of fire <laughs> that you also played talked yes about. <laughs> yes and that one um yeah it's the same same metaphor for fog of war and actually yeah. that's what um that strategy game does too uh at the gates also has the yeah. same idea of watercoloring in a book uh it, it's fine but i don't give a fuck about the book <laughs> like the, <laughs> the, the painting on parchment style is really nice but um i think i'm i'm salty because uh what was it called? Ring of Fire. <laughs> I played this game. Think... Shit, like, Trials of Fire. That's what it is. Uh, um, okay. uh, its menu fucking sucks because of the book metaphor. It's uh, it's a closed book. For God's sake, open the damn book. You can't have a closed <laughs> book as your menu. And it has little bookmarks down the side, each of which are the options, but it doesn't. None of them are labeled. They're just blank bookmarks, and you have to mouse over each one to find out what the fucking option is to, <laughs> to know how to navigate. It. And then also the other thing about Trials of Fire initially. They've added an option to fix this now, but um, initially, when you're at night, it was just dark and you can't see the fucking book. Like you can't even see the menu, and you bring it on menu. That was also at night, so it's just like <laughs> invisible options. <laughs> and what does it mean that you're playing in a book environment and you're playing cards within it? You know, like are the cards part of the book? Do they come? Yeah, they in the it's back a bit of, of a mixed book? metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> you should be playing playing like torn out pages from the book. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, I, w I, I have a, another game I want you to play, Tom. Oh, yeah? Oh, is uh, it the Animals one that just came out? Yes. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's on my I wish think, list, so... Cool. It's, yeah, it's Banners of Ruin, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, because all of these games are something of something. Uh, it's <laughs> incredibly hard to remember. But it's basically... Yeah, yeah it's like... Me medieval deck building rpg but everyone's an anthropomorphic animal and so it's yeah. like the trailer is like house blackthorn has been betrayed <laughs> uh, and you know rabbits in armor getting it's shot to death dead by uh, arrows in a sort of parisian back street <laughs> uh, it's, it, but it's you know it's then it's like side on battles where you're positioning y units and um your draw each of your units can be drawn from the six animal factions and each faction has its own set of cards to unlock as abilities it looks nice nice art style yeah um but I, so many of these games and i I'm, prefer if you played them and then just told me about them <laughs> that is fine by me <laughs> good yeah i'm excited about that one like god bless monster train for uh, for having a name that's just fucking out yeah. there <laughs> it's just, yeah. here's a fucking train full of monsters you haven't heard that one before <laughs> <laughs> and it's metaphor just makes no sense at all. <laughs> yep, yep. So therefore, there's no logical fallacy or anything. Like it's just, just like, just come you know, on, it's, train. It's, it's a hell train that somehow has like the sort the soul of hell on it, and also angels are boarding it, but they have to go upwards for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take that over Trials of Fire any day as as a title. <laughs> Do you remember? Um... The game that George Fan made before Plants vs. Zombies. Oh. Uh, was it Insane Aquarium? Was yeah, that's other? right. Insane Aquarium. Yeah. And then the way that Plants vs. Zombies came about was he was trying to make an Insane, Insane Aquarium sequel. And he was like imagining it as like a two-story double-decker fish tank and then like enemies would come in to like the top <laughs> tank and filter down to the and he decided basically oh wait this is a stupid metaphor <laughs> and like it became the different lanes basically of of plants versus zombies um <laughs> uh that's what i always think about <laughs> when i play monster train as like they had a stupid metaphor, but then just kept going. <laughs> rather, than... <laughs> I think it's great. It's, it's fine. I do yeah. love that we can, from the future, we can sort of shout at George Fan, going, "Of course, why are you talking about? 
<laughs> Double decker. You know, obviously they're on a lawn. They're on a lawn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the and most the obvious game concept ever. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's a bunch of plants be. on a lawn shooting <laughs> peas at zombies. Yeah. You know, that genre. <laughs> Why couldn't you find your game immediately? <laughs> It's almost as if games take long and winding roads to completion. <laughs> what was um they want to play his one after Plants of Zombies, uh Octageddon? Yes. I didn't play very much of it, but I did play it. Yeah, that was quite fun. It didn't uh, it didn't click the same way Plants of Zombies did, but it was no. it was entertaining. It's very much like an arcade game. It was, you know, spin wildly and shoot things in different directions and now one of your tentacles is a puffin. You know, that genre. That's right. Yeah, that that <laughs> one. Yeah, there was sort of after, you know, I was, yeah, it, there wasn't an awful lot of feeling of control to it, which um, I think I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> in between in between Plants vs. Zombies and Octogaden, he actually worked on Magic the Gathering for a while. He did, <laughs> really? didn't he? Yeah. 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 He joined, he, he designed a, like a zombie themed card for them, but then joined Wizards of the Coast full time for a bit. He's joined another studio full time now since Octogaden came out, but I can't remember where. Hmm. What else have you been playing, Tom? Uh, what indeed? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Wildermuth. Wildermuth. Thank God for Steam being on screen. Um, <laughs> which I haven't played enough of, so I'll, I'll just be brief and I'll probably return to it when I've played more. But it is uh, become a bit of a phenomenon. So it's a comic book looking game oh god it's got a fucking book metaphor as well i just loaded up the scene page and the first thing that happens is a big old old timey tome opens up um it is at time of right time of speaking it has uh 6373 reviews 95 of which are positive so mm. this has been a um phenomenon and it it kind of it wasn't well known before it came out um and it kind of just skyrocketed once it did i'm so pleased about that because i i played it um early on um and um and like yeah i'm really pleased that it's become popular because um because obviously a lot of love has been put into it yeah so it's a procedural story thing i would say it's it's kind of like xcom in its structure where you, there's an overworld with a map and you're choosing territories to attack or do things in and when you do that ultimately you're going to be leading a squad of, of fantasy heroes to defeat some monsters on a grid-based thing in a turn-based way but in between that there's going to be a lot of uh discussion between your your characters and they are all named people with with backstories and relationships to each other and in fact you choose those so one of the first things that happens is one character meets up with another and you have three dialogue options uh, each of which is labeled to tell you it will kind of established that the the existing relationship between those characters is either friends rivals or lovers um so you kind of decide what the relationships between your characters are in that way and then you pretty quickly get a squad of three i have not met anyone else since then but i understand that you continue to to accumulate new characters and i can't really speak to how much of it is proc gen and how much of it is going to unfold the same way because all the dialogue is, is pre-written, um, at least in some sense. I'm sure nouns and, and things are switched in. Um, but the little story moments between the people are very specific. They are, you know, I just had one where uh, a char one of my characters asked another one to run off with him in the night to investigate something that he would not tell her what it is. And um, it's there's some part of his memory that's missing, and he want he ultimately wants her to help investigate that. And I won't say anything more about that plot. I can't... I don't even know whether it's a spoiler because maybe that's like a one in a thousand thing that you won't get, or maybe that's a key thing that happens to every character, <laughs> um, which is yeah one reason I want to play more and, and get back to it. I, I can't really say it's clicked for me. And I think part of it is because I took a bit of a break in between. I played it at first and it didn't really grab me. And then, so I didn't play it for a while. And then everyone kept on going on about how great it is. So I went back to it and I've sort of forgotten a bit about who my characters are and what I said their relationships were and stuff like that. And it all really builds on that stuff. So I don't recommend doing what I did. If you're going to play it, like um, uh, do it when you've got some time to, to dig into it properly. Uh, Cause I think your investment is probably going to be what makes it pay off. Um, but yeah, I found it just the overworld. Uh, I found it hard to figure out what I was supposed to be doing there. I've got loads of options about like recruiting people and crafting new items and stuff, but I just don't have a clear picture in my head of what all that means and what I'm working towards and why I'm doing it. I think I'm actually still in the tutorial. I think there's, I actually did. I, I found eventually figured out where on the interface my objective was and 
understood it and realized like half the territories I was looking at are actually completely impassable and I can't go there. And it's more focused than it appeared at first. It initially filmed, felt just completely overwhelming because it was this massive map where I could go in any direction and um, uh, didn't know what I was supposed to be trying to do. Once I did figure out what I was supposed to be doing, it, it, it was to like invade every hostile territory and clear out every monster. And mm. I just did three missions like that and they're all really similar. And my characters are leveling up and they get it. I'm interested in what abilities they're unlocking, but those missions were all just so samey. Um, and I gather that's not the case for, for the rest of it. Like, you know, it sounds like as you get more characters um, and more, you know, different classes and, and they develop over time, um, that that is what adds the, the interest to it. Uh, the enemies are also like leveling up in some way that it keeps on telling me about, but I don't really care about. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm glad I'm glad it's telling me it's happened. I, I, but it it always does this big fanfare of like, here is the new ability this creature gained, and here's how it fits into this web of upgrades that all of the enemies have have now got since you took. You know, each as time passes, all these upgrades are happening, and it's a big list that it seems to want me to examine. And I'm just like, I can't. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I'm just going to move on. We'll find out what a badger does on the next mission when a badger does it to me. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the thing I've heard that intrigues me, that makes me want to keep keep on with it, is that um, several people have said it's it's the the XCOM game where my best guy died and I just went with it because it felt right for the story, which is a real achievement. That's kind of the holy grail of these mm. of these things is to make the player so invested in the narrative that they'll accept a a gameplay loss because it feels like it fits in the narrative. Yeah, I think that's why I kind of stopped i've kind of always meant to go back to it but i kind of i think i had a pass here i, I did get through the, the tutorial is quite a long time ago now but i remember i got into a series of levels and it was just the there was just uh everything became really really hard and there was fire everywhere and the enemies were really tough and and uh they were able to cross long distances and one of my characters was killed and then another one was killed because now there are just two left and you know and i was um i just got completely steamrolled and it didn't feel it didn't feel like a good story <laughs> um <laughs> but a short um, story <laughs> yeah i i i really want to capture sort of some of the stuff that kind of i remember i know that um sin vega wrote a series of cool posts on um Rob Weber Shotgun about her experiences. And I think, yeah, I would um I really want to uh I want to experience that too. I did have one very uh fun encounter where so my, my main warrior has a frying pan because that's a, that was the first choice I was asked to make about him was does he take the rusty dagger or does he take the frying pan? And I was like, okay, of course the frying pan. Um <laughs> and he's since leveled up and and become, you know, quite a quite a good warrior but he hasn't found a new weapon yet and uh that story mission i I mentioned about his backstory um led to a boss encounter and it's someone who had a lot of armor and uh uh, a lot of health and my first few attacks against her all missed or i i still don't know the game well enough to know whether like armor makes attacks miss or i think one of them was blocked but i didn't know if that meant like she blocked it with a shield or something or if that just means it didn't do enough damage to get through her armor or whatever but anyway Mm. she'd lost zero health and so i think on turn two i'm looking at where she is i'm looking at where my warrior is and where my um my mage is my mage can do this thing where she can interfuse objects and that means every like bit of scenery has a different ability that she can do with it like she can if it's a wooden bench she can blow it up into into a load of splinters and if it's a rock she can make it throw a disc of rock at somebody and that's a more of a projectile attack um and one of hers i think it is the splinter blast shreds armor so i'm like okay if i can she can blow up this bench into splinters and that will shred armor this is gonna be a long fight so i want to i want to not just you know get through this this boss's armor i want to destroy the armor so it will help all future attacks against her and that's really important to me and i'll i'll you know focus this whole turn on getting making that happen she's not currently in the blast radius of that that bench or whatever it was i think it was a tree trunk uh but my warrior has enough movement to get behind her and his main attack pushes so if he gets behind her and then whacks her towards the the splinter blast radius then afterwards my mage could blow up the the tree trunk into splinters shred her armor and then my archer still has enough action points to uh to shoot her with her i think she's in stealth at this point or she has some some special attack she can do from where she is that would be perfect after the armor is already gone 
So I'm planning this like three step plan. I have my warrior go up behind her, hit her with a frying pan to knock her into the blast radius, and she just dies. <laughs> just get an immediate victory screen. <laughs> Battle over. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> what? Perfect. I guess his, his attack is quite powerful now. <laughs> just like one shot at her. <laughs> so everyone else is just like, oh, all right. <laughs> I guess we go home. <laughs> what have you guys been playing? Um, I played a couple of games that I wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to actually do a quick shout out first to um, uh, Neurocracy. Um, we did a special part with um, its kind of lead developer, um, Johannes, um, a few months ago. And um, yeah, so the, the game Neurocracy is now out. It's a it's a really interesting game, and I'm not really not ready to talk about it because it's um, episodic. Um, so the story expands is the best way to talk about it over time, uh, because this is a game or narrative thing, interactive narrative, I suppose you call it. I don't know. Anyway, it's based in a, in a, uh, on a, in a fictional Wikipedia called the Omnipedia. And, um, uh, a murder has happened of a, uh, of a, of a kind of, um, um, a, a sort of a, a tech CEO guy um, and you, you're you not really tasked with, with solving it but you will find yourself trying to figure out um, what what what's behind the death and all about the context of the death and, and what's going on in the world through Omnipedia which is this Wikipedia and it is it's really clever um, it's sort of remarkably i don't know it's just on on the nose all the time um so uh it's set in the future 2040 something or other um um in a world where where china fundamentally it sort of is the the world leader um uh and various corporations are vying for control and what you learn um through the few web, very long and in-depth um wikipedia entries um in episode one is that um is that 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 lots of these companies are vying for control over installing uh ai and or brain implants basically um which which are in the wake of a big pandemic uh are collecting information or ostensibly installed in people's brains to collect information on outbreaks of future outbreaks of, of pandemics so that the world can better defend itself uh, against them. But of course, under that, lots of information is being collected on people himself and it's about control over people and that kind of thing. Um, there was a, uh, a kind of like a sample of the game which uh, Marsh and I had played it before the, um, the the interview we did um, a few months ago, and that was very much set around a kind of a storyline which obviously exists in uh, the, the 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 released game. But I don't know quite how it all plays into it in that one because this is all what it comes across as is, is speculative sci-fi. This is like pure science fiction about you know interesting. In, uh, questions about what would it be like if uh, um, such and such scientific situation in a world that we all recognize um, might happen. And in that um, that demo version that we played, uh, it supposed that um, uh, a, an illness broke out among fish and was uh, f specifically among salmon, um, intensively farmed fish fat salmon, uh, fish farming, salmon farming, uh, mm -hmm. causing a sort of in, sort of mad cow disease, but from fish. And I think that was the cause of the pandemic that um, that the kind of the world is was reeling from in in episode one of um, of the final game, and the episodes kind of zoom forward in time day by day as the drama around uh, the, the 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 assassination of the CEO of a company that's been installing these um, brain implants uh, plays out and. Um, Omnipedia, this Wikipedia that you're you're reading through, this uh, you can see the history of the pages. So, and it will do the comparison pages that you can do on Wikipedia, so you can see the changes. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of information and interesting nuances that you can see through edits and things. 
and uh, slowly the world just gets filled in and filled in and filled in. And it's all, it's incredibly smart. And there are loads of sort of side stories and little avenues you can dip down. There's some really interesting sort of pieces of kind of sort of uh, fictional design where obviously they haven't built an entire Wikipedia. So a lot of terms and a lot of them terms are real terms. Uh, they they come up as pop-ups rather than actual pages you go to. So you're not going to be distracted all the time by going off the wrong way. So it feels much more focused than you feel you might fear it might uh, be. But I really recommend it. It's um it's £15 for a kind of a, a, a season's pass, a season pass. And like it's all beautifully written in world. So kind of even the 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 cookie, the GDPR cookie page kind of plays into the fiction of the <laughs> of the game as well. So like and you know, as you buy, you know, if you buy the, the season pass, you'll get it too. But yeah, Neurocracy, uh, it's a wick omnipedia dot app uh, if you visit there for more info. But um yeah, it's really interesting and sort of it's really cool to be able to kind of read something on my iPad, which is a game and is sort of interactive but sort of static and but also growing over time. Um yeah, it's cool shit. Yeah. But um, yeah, like gamey wise, uh, I want to talk about um, the Forgotten City, uh, which um, which is based on uh, it just came out, but it was um, it's been long in the making, and it's based on uh, a mod the same team of three or four people made for Skyrim ages ago. Did you did either of you play that mod? No, no. So uh, you may have come across it, uh, but yeah. it is um, yeah, it's. I don't I'll try not to be spoilery. It's kind of a difficult thing. It's, it's a game. It's a time loop game um, where you are a person who lives in uh, a contemporary world, uh, and you find yourself flung back. You, you sort of go into a sort of a, a temple, uh, a falling down Roman temple, uh, just off the banks of the River Tiber, and you are flung back in time to a city which is uh in a vast cavern underground um uh, this roman city is filled with romans and they live in roman kind of villas and go to roman temples and there are about 23 people there and you, it's very specifically small number of people because you will get to know all these people because they all play out um a day of, in the history of this this place and at the end of that day um when a specific thing happens, uh, time stops and you loop back to the start again. And your aim is fundamentally to get back home again and you will get back home in theory. And I'm not sure whether this is, you know, there may be a twist in all this, but the, the plan is that if you can cause a, um, a, a, a paradox which causes one of the people that lives in the city to not do a special ritual which has called you into the city then and therefore fix the problem of the city then you won't be there anymore and therefore you'll be free of it um and the thing in the city is that um uh people keep turning to gold <laughs> which is oh, um sure. uh, <laughs> shit <laughs> uh uh and uh, uh, the the reason why people get turned to gold is that um it, there's a curse here which um if anybody in the city uh, commits a sin, um, ev- uh, everybody in the city will be turned to gold. Um, and again, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and somebody during the course of the day that you're summoned here uh, will will commit a sin, and you need to find out who they are um, and deal with it. <laughs> it's uh, basically nice like place a, until then. <laughs> yeah, until the, it is a really nice place, and like that is the thing with this. Like, it's it's obviously made by just a few people, but they have really invested all of the effort in the right places. You know, it's a stunning looking game in a lot of places. It's sort of I don't think it's running in. I'm pretty sure it's not running in Skyrim's engine um, anymore. It looks like it's in something like I. It might. I don't. I guess it might be, but it looks like um, Unreal or something to me. It's sort of uh, and sort of they really got a good marble feel going on in its shaders Mm -hmm. and they got a good mosaic feel and a good sort of relief you know sort of carved relief stuff going on it's it's sort of it's 
I do. I mean, I've always been fascinated by kind of the, the Roman aesthetic, you know, just the thing, sort of the stone, the carving, the kind of the paintings and things. And um, he really does capture that. And um, and it's an open city that you're wandering around and, and you're meeting people. And, and fundamentally, you're spending most of the time talking to people and finding out what their problems are and fixing the problems. It almost could be uh, interactive fiction. Um, except for there are some little bits which kind of involve exploration. And I was surprised that there are some action sequences as well. Um, uh, again, I won't, I won't kind of spoil anything, but um, it's, I'm really enjoying it. Like it, it, they've captured a scale which feels uh, like I can k- keep most of the characters in my head at once and know their and their motivations are clear, and therefore, when people mention a name, I know what they're on about. Despite the fact there are twenty odd people, and people, there are lots of themes going on. You know, there's a there's an election going on, and there are two front runners. And which one do you want to go for? There are people in love with each other. There's um, a, 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 one of the characters um, is sort of being defamed by another. Um, another character has disappeared out of the of the of, of, of the, the city, and are they dead? Did they manage to escape? What happened to them? There are loads of threads you can follow, and that's really what the game is—a a game about following threads and to see where they lead. And um, and I feel very much that in safe hands, like all of those leads are worth going along. That they're leading somewhere that will kind of uh, along with these tributaries towards the kind of like the main river of, of, of kind of escaping this place. It's cool. It's, it's well done. The writing is pretty good. Like it's really succinct given that you're doing a lot of talking, people get their points across fast, fast without sort of losing character. You know, they, they have voices and character, you know, they get themselves across the voice work is really well done as well. Like, again, they've really put, the effort where it really counts it's sort of the actors there are lots of different actors it doesn't suffer from that skyrim thing of course coming across the same voice actors all the time like there are you know they have voices that i recognize and it's it's good like I, it's there's some little things about it that i'm a little bit like it's very it's very on the nose in places um there have been there's some real kind of like references to pandemics which i can completely you know, except in something like neurocracy, but in this one, like a sort of like a, a wink about pandemics is sort of a bit bit much because I'm meant to be mm. talking to Romans and it all feels a bit sort of you know shoehorned in. There's a Karen joke, you know, the kind of that thing about <laughs> sort of the Karen archetype, the character which is like very suspect and I'm kind of uncomfortable with it as it is, you know, that sort of stereotype thing. But there's a joke about Karen's in it which didn't sit very well there's there's like a nod and a wink about kind of um, foreign interference in elections and things which feel a little bit out of it um it's particularly is like most of the time uh, the, the theme of a very heavy kind of heavy-handed discussions about um what are the correct ways what are the good ways of running a society and about philosophical responses to 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 running societies you know the idea of stoicism and and uh, about uh the the mor- that, the difference between morality and 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 being good and and law and big Wait. big stuff like that did, did you say that if anyone in the city commits a sin everybody gets turned into gold yeah <laughs> And your that's point. Because qu- <laughs> that's quite, I mean, it's great that it's working for them as a society. So that's <laughs> like worked out okay. But I'm like, what is the nature of their philo- philosophical discussions about morality? Like, how is that impacted by the fact that they live in a society under the constant fear of being turned into gold if any one of them covets their neighbor's wife? You're, you're, <laughs> like, ask, you're, you're, you're asking all the right questions. <laughs> and, and like, I, I, so when when this thing came up, as the character was describing, you know, that concept. So I, w- I should say this is a curse. This is place upon these people who have also found themselves just sort of transported to the city. Um, they've also been cursed. They're here and they don't know why they've been here. They've been living together for a few months now. 
and they've they've kind of been living with the knowledge that one of them at any point you know if any of them commit a sin and i was you know like oh god you know is this game gonna just acknowledge that that you know what the hell is a sin and that's the first question you get to ask the person who tells you about it like well so what is a sin <laughs> because <laughs> sort of like and he says well yeah that was a really difficult thing we, we've been arguing about this for the past few months but like i'm the magistrate here and my way of think about it is that we 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 uphold the law the roman law um because that's as good as you get and then you have a little discussion about well, how were you saying that the, the Romans did all sorts of bad shit and to which he has answers. It deals with this stuff remarkably well. Like it's all there. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it, and yeah, like the, the morality versus law thing is absolutely front and center and, and, you know, and, and, and how you deal with it. So the, this kind of legionnaire who, um, who, who, who uh, upholds the law for the, for the uh, magistrate, he's a stoic and, to the extent of breaking out loads of quotes to you as you talk to him, like it, it has, it also is bearing the burden of wanting to tell you about Roman history and Roman culture hmm. as well. I mean, it's definitely, it's not smooth and it's not elegant and you do feel kind of talked at quite a lot. Um, but like, it's also interesting, you know, like, even if the interest is sometimes like, is it going to deal with this thing that seems really obvious? Oh yeah, it is. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah. At, at the moment I would say that it is very buggy. So I wanted to play more of it and I started playing this morning and I was in the middle of a sequence, an action sequence where the item I needed to do all the actioning, uh, I, I had no longer in my hands and I, there's no way you can't, they don't, you have an inventory, but you can't select items to use from your inventory uh and so and that is a it's a just a bug and like lot i can pick up multiple items of a unique of a unique thing which is looks like it's a problem as well there's it's like it's made by just a few people um i think another criticism i've had of it is that um sometimes the, the solutions so a lot of the a lot of the kind of the puzzle solving is kind of thrust upon you where you know there's a problem, so how are you going to get somebody to do something? And you you kind of try something out, and then you have a few conversations, and somebody tells you something, and you don't really realize that that's the thing. But next time you talk to the to the problem person involved in the problem, suddenly a new dialogue option is there, which solves the problem. And I said, okay, well, I didn't think of that, but luckily yeah. my character did for me, mm. and I don't <laughs> think I feel an awful lot of kind of um, uh, reward for that. But well, at least the story is continuing. So. It, again like this was a this was a mod made by a few people quite a few years ago now and i think that it bears that um that heritage quite a lot it really isn't a very elegant game i but, mean that's what i was going to ask have they gained anything by making it no longer a mod other than presumably the ability to charge money for it i, th I believe that there are more stories there are it, it is better developed it's it's the 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 store the, the quest is better designed it's smooth it's smooth i think it might have some more locations I, it, it it's good looking voice acting it may i think the original may have been voice acted but this is professionally voice acted um you know it looks better runs better if you ignore the bugs you know yeah i think that's the i think that's the hook here yeah i was wondering if it still felt skyrim -y in terms of like the structure of its quests like do you walk through a town and a, and a man walking by an npc says yes yes <laughs> have you heard about the gray wolf or whatever the great fox or whatever it is whatever the skyrim equivalent is. <laughs> they, they they yeah they do and as you walk past and and even during conversations so that's why i think maybe maybe it is in maybe it is still in the in the skyrim engine because in the middle of conversations time continues and people will walk in between you and <laughs> say something while you're while you're in conversation but actually Super. that's serving to f also feel like a live place um which is which is good really um also when you talk to somebody uh they do the kind of like turn around and then the zoom in on their face which um you know their classic sort of um skyrim thing where sometimes it doesn't work quite properly or they're kind of like oh, craning their leg around at a strange angle because they're sitting down or something like that 
sort of you know but that's you know it it does feel the movement is quite skyrim as well like the jump is quite is that skyrim stiff jump thing that sort of you never know quite whether you're on a surface (laughs) whether you've succeeded have you tried placing a bucket over anyone's head yet? Oh, you can't, <laughs> yeah, you can't pick up objects. Oh, it's real. It's a real shame. It's a real uh, shame. <laughs> one way to solve that problem: just cut off your hands, <laughs> pick things up. But yeah, Spawn to City. I have been enjoying it, and I think that you may too. <laughs> um, nice. The other thing, I'll just quickly mention. Oh, should I mention it? You have now. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, we, we, so, so listeners, we, we, before we started, I mentioned that I've been playing Day of the Tentacle with my daughter and have been quite enjoying it, despite spending the last 15 years sort of having decided I don't, I hate adventure games and, <laughs> um, and, and I've kind of, yeah, okay, this is, this is a good game. This is a good game. And I, I, yeah. We started having an interesting conversation. Then I said I refused to talk about it because, because, because you know I don't know I don't know why did I want refuse? <laughs> because uh, other people I want... have opinions on adventure games was the reason. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, I'm just trying to think about why I decided I dislike them, and I think that I think that maybe it was maybe it is a mistake to decide that actually I've to change my mind on the basis of playing one of the very best adventure games because. Um, a lot of the kind of the cliches about adventure games kind of just aren't really upheld by Day of the Tentacle where um, it, I think it's, you know, I can remember a lot of the puzzles just a little bit. So when a character hints an answer to one of the puzzles and I remember what it was, oh, that, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we have to get that. Uh, mm. the, the the hints are quite elegant and, and just smartly done and amusing the yeah. way that they kind of, the, the way they hinted i'm trying to think and because i wasn't really prepared to talk about it i can't trying to think of an example and i don't does think it I have can. so i remember monkey island there is like a tips line you could call <laughs> <laughs> um so i got hundred star wars or whatever it is i can't actually remember how it worked because it, it's i feel like in the manual there was literally a tip line you could call in real life to get hints but then in the game in monkey island 2 you found an old phone box on one of the islands and you could call the hint line from there yeah um i guess until you reach that point i guess in-game hints were not available (laughs) um and i I don't remember how useful they were when they are available but i wanted to shout out chicory because um that is a recently released um uh really lovely adventure game i have not played enough of it to talk about it yet uh but i will do um because what i've played is is wonderful and there is the hint line system in that is uh, a phone you go to and you call your parents and <laughs> it's really sweet. Your mom answers the phone and you can ask her for like, like, what am I, what do you think I should do, mom? And she will give you like a very vague sort of sense. I think you're, you're trying to, you know, uh, get this item for this person. And then, uh, it's established that your dad is is a much more specific advice giver. <laughs> and she asks you, do you want me to get your dad? So if you really need it to spell out what you need to do, you ask for your dad and your dad says, oh, I think you need to do this and this and this. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it's so cute. And that's yeah, what I needed. Really like that, the way, the thing you describe, Alex, sounds ideal for me with adventure games where you once knew the solution and now when there's just a little bit of a nudge that, that you can make those leaps that are so difficult the first time from you know, uh, the problem to a solution that doesn't really make physical sense or, or you skip over the seven different more logical ways of fixing it that don't work in the game. Yeah, and it's quite nice because you remember the, I remember often remember the kind of like the end and it's a matter of piecing the bits in between, which is actually sort of quite a nice sort of almost sort of sleuthing because I remember, for instance, um, in the future bit of the story, your character um, is in the world of the tentacles who have taken over the world and um, uh, you, because you're a human, you're a second, um, you're kind of sort of enslaved fundamentally and you are um, unable to have the free run of the house that you need to be able to solve the puzzles. And the solution to that, I remember, is that you need to wear a costume which is made as the, the is a flag and in order to get that flag, and I thought, okay, well, it's a flag, isn't it? But why is it a flag? And then you realize, oh, in the past, 
you actually you talk to the designer of the American flag and the flag you need. Yes, you need to change the US flag to being the shape of a tentacle and slowly <laughs> like, ah, the poster on the wall. And then, uh, no, no. and then it all just sort of flips in. And yeah, <laughs> it's nice not to have to slip or sweat over that stuff and just sort of feel, yes, it's all falling into place. <laughs> yeah, like the, the glib thing I said, uh, and I stand by it, <laughs> is that uh, adventure games would be great without the puzzles. Uh, obviously, Dare, <laughs> Dare the Tentacle, it sounds like the puzzles are quite core to it. Like the, the whole time travel logic, you know, yeah. sort of is expressed through puzzles. Uh, so that's probably an exception. But it does make me wonder, like, if Gone Home had been a side-scrolling point-and-click game, would it have triggered yeah. the same kind of, you know, sea change where... Because I feel like that was... It wasn't the first, um, you know, walking simulator or, or purely narrative game, but it was the when they broke into the mainstream, I feel like. It was, it was big, it was popular, and from then on, that was a genre that could be popular. Yeah, I th I remember that the 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 big draw for me in the '90s when these games came out was the because you you know, I was unused to um, the idea of uh, having a, a cutscene. So cutscenes were just unspeakably rewarding at the time because the idea of being shown video was or you know <laughs> animated sequences just stunning, and then the chance to see new pictures as well, and they were always well drawn like the new like lucas art stuff certainly um and be able to to see a sequence of new places that looked really good that was a reward in itself as well and i i remember that the gone home the pool for gone home was was you're exploring in first person a, a, a house like obviously the idea of exploring a space was very you know common by the time that the gone came came out but the the experience of exploring was was the game and i don't and i think you'd lose so much because yeah. figuring out how the game the, the house fitted together and finding the seat the, the kind of like the 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 places where people had led that se left secrets and looking under stuff and opening drawers and that kind of thing i don't think you could do that in point and click quite oh, maybe you could maybe you could no, I think you're right. It wouldn't have the same effect. Like gone home. You need to from... be in that. You need to feel you're there in a way that. Um, yeah, that you, gone you home came from it. immersive sim DNA, and the immersive yeah. part is is what they you know sort of went deep on. Um, and that feeling. I mean, I think one of the reasons it worked so well is because it felt like a horror game, even though that yes. isn't what it is. Like it didn't pay off on that intentionally, but being in a scary situation, you are more immersed and more like alert to every detail and snooping around through drawers and stuff has a sort of magical um yeah. you know energy to it uh you know it's it's a heightened um thing that then even though a scare isn't coming you are just absorbing more information than you would be if it was just a kind of very casual strolling around a scenery side on thing yeah like where you're looking you're not you're not there you're looking at a character there you're kind of third it's totally third person yeah definitely yeah, and I think I'm also really aware of these, you know, Dare the Tentacle, you know what you can interact with, you mouse over stuff, and it doesn't have the pixel hunting problem that kind of is another one of the the bugbears of that genre. But so you always know what you can um, interact with, which, you know, I think takes away some of the being there um potential in it which it doesn't it isn't missing in it because it's not what it's trying to go for but yeah 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 but it's, yeah, it's really best... interesting my daughter loves it <laughs> just like and we should the, her save got corrupted and she enjoyed just playing it all again and like she just I, no i love it I, I can just do the same things that we saw before all over again love it <laughs> <laughs> graham what is the best adventure game mm. did you like them graham Yes. Yeah, I liked them as a kid because I, you know, I played a bunch of them on the Amiga 500 and then on the PC after that. And then I went through a period in my early 20s where I replayed a bunch of them. And I also was, I was playing a lot of, um, what was it called? What was that adventure game making tool called? 
the, like there was a tool that someone made that produced a lot of indie 2D, 2D point and click adventures, basically. Right. There was a website. You could download them for free. Um, and there was a lot of really good stuff made from that community. And so I used to play them quite regularly in the early days when I was at PC Gamer and putting stuff on the disc and that sort of thing. Um, similar to you in that I went through a phase where I was more down on them. I think there was a real you know, a pushback against overly narrative focused games rather than systems focused games. Yeah. And I think I pushed back against games, which seemed inelegant, like the kind of like indie game renaissance around 2010. A lot of it was based around, Oh wow, this game is, is systemically and thematically so consistent. And the way it's communicating everything to you is really slick. And then it's got this like one set core idea that it then expands on across, you know, the braid thing, um, a world with goo, for example, whereas adventure games are the exact opposite of that. You know, every puzzle is a bespoke thing that it has to try and explain to you how this particular puzzle works. And then it's not going to do that very well. And because you don't understand what you're doing, yeah, you got the, the weight of the author is kind of like pressing on you. Yeah. And so, like, I think I went through a phase of, of being kind of down on them. But I, I, I've gone back to them since a little bit. And I think I would probably play them with a walkthrough on a second screen <laughs> that I would alt-tab to a lot. Um, but I think I still think Day of the Tentacle and Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis and the first Sam and Max at the Road mm. and Monkey Island 2 and 3 are all great games and really funny and still have like some of the best writing in any video games. I think probably the best one is day of the tentacle. Yeah. Um, because as Tom says, the, the time travel stuff is, is so core to its systems. Like it's the only LucasArts adventure game. I think that has that marriage just right. Um, it's maybe not the one I love the most though. I probably still love monkey, monkey Island two more. As you know, that was probably the first one I played and completed on my own yeah. on the Amiga 500 back in the day, which is a big part of it. But I also just I love the characters in that world, and the this strange ending just captivated me as a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ending is amazing. Oh, I just um, I just remembered something that I was going to say about Forgotten City. Sorry to to go back to this, but um. With it, I, I'm always quite interested in time loop games and how they deal with the idea of, of what's persistent between the loops and how they uh, kind of uh, give a reason for what how things are persistent and you know ensuring that what you do in any loop kind of leak you know is a continuation of stuff. And I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not sure the solution of this one is particularly good, but I thought found it really interesting. Um, because I was really interested in the first loop, what would happen to the items that I pick up? And they all come with you. <laughs> Everything hmm. that you picked up, physical, just is just in your pocket still. Huh. And I had no idea that was going to happen. I thought, oh, am I going to have to collect all this shit again? And yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> it's amazing. It was just kind of freeing, but also kind of perplexing at the same time. Um, and there are some... And then there are some kind of story threads that where you make permanent um, uh, uh, kind of pro progress in them, like you solve a relationship between two people. And um, I was wondering, so are they somehow kind of made permanent in the world as if kind of you fix them and therefore the magic of the world just kind of means that now you've redressed some sort of eternal balance or something? So, no, instead you... When you, as soon as you come through the the time loop, uh, this into, out of this temple place that you start from, uh, there's this character uh, who greets you, and you just give him a list of stuff to do. <laughs> like, <laughs> go and tell such and such not to go there, and instead to do this. <laughs> okay. Also, please, <laughs> please inform such and such is the is the person who's been doing this, and they're very very sorry. Good. Okay. And also. <laughs> Time loop so persistent. <laughs> yeah, like this poor bastard has to run off. <laughs> Please give the medicine immediately to this person because <laughs> so weird. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but I kind of I really like its ham fistedness. It's like it's just so honest. <laughs> Couldn't think of anything good here. <laughs> Fuck it, we'll get the farmer to do it. <laughs> 
Anyway, sorry, I just I had to get that off. <laughs> anyway, um, huh, uh, that's all the time we have uh, for this episode. Um, thanks for listening. I always do that. I say the thanks for listening, even though I know it as well. <laughs> I'm going to say thanks for listening. We're all going to say it. That's the thing we do. It's like I'm not a good host or something. You can never be anyway, thanked enough for listening. No, that's true. I, we are pitifully, pitifully grateful. Um, anyway, you can hang out with us and our community on our Discord channel, which is lovely. Um, and if you have a question for future episodes, uh, send to us questions at CreightonCrowbar.com or tweet at us at Creighton Crowbar on Twitter. You can also listen to the podcast on YouTube on our YouTube channel where you'll find some other uh, side projects that we've worked on, which is uh, at uh, youtube.com Creighton Crowbar. Um, Creighton Crowbar is kindly funded by our Patreon backers. If you would like to know more about supporting the podcast and its spin offs, visit us at uh, patreon.com slash Creighton Crowbar. Or all of these uh, links are found on our website at creatingcrowbar.com. That includes for our um, Discord, which I mentioned earlier on and failed to tell you how to find it. I think that's about it. Um, I've been Alex Wiltshire. I've been Tom Francis. And I shall remain Graham Smith. Thanks, Thanks for listening. Oh,